Com. Lior, welcome back to the show. Hey, Kerry. Thanks for having me back. As always. So, so you've got uh, some interesting things, uh, interesting takes on things going. What is going on in the world right now as you see it? Um, well, we, we just had a G20 meeting. Uh, G20 summit. I think what was very interesting in, in the G20 is that usually, Kerry, they have a draft of the consensus uh, points, um, everything that all the members uh, countries are agreeing to. They have that uh, drafted few months in advance um, before. No, no, they don't release it until after, but they make sure that each one of the uh, of the member uh, countries agree to it that that's the uh, the posture and, and the points that they want to get across to the to Reuters and to Associated Press etc this time it was drafted during the conference so they can reach an actual um, you know unified unilateral point uh, and theme for this conference and this shows you how the BRIC countries, um, which is obviously Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, how they are trying to uh, take the world, not trying, they are taking the world to a different place, um, to a different future. And on the flip side, I think um, uh, the United States recognizes that they are in rebuilding mode, in reinvention mode, that they need to adapt to 21st century realities uh, because not in the not too distant future, uh, China will surpass the GDP of the United States. There, the United States is is a quarter of the world's economy. That's massive. It's, mm-hmm. it's really big. Uh, but China has come to a point where it's now fifteen percent, and mm-hmm. that's insane. So two countries are responsible for 40% of the world's economic activity. And you add Japan and Germany to that, and those four alone are uh, just about 60% of the world's economy. So four countries out of 200, they they make everything um, and, and produce and, and service, etc. So all the countries of the world are servicing these four beasts, basically, and get served by them. And those four will continue to dictate what's going to happen in the next 10 years. But with China aligning on this One Belt, One Road initiative um, with many countries, that is essentially a war. Uh, it's a cold war, but it's a war because they're diverting resources, diverting troops, diverting alliances, diverting. And, and on the flip side. You see President Trump, the administration in the U.S., trying to combat this with building a new future for the United States because they are, they know that in the next few years, the role of the dollar will continue to decline. In fact, if you go to wealthresearchgroup.com forward slash drama and forward slash attack, I wrote two incredibly important reports on this subject of how the world is de-dollarizing and why this is so important because in 2018 the dollar up until a week ago was the best performing asset on the planet and that is very rare for a fiat currency to do that it means that you know all the hedge funds uh, all the hedge fund managers could have gone on a sabbatical for 2018 have gone to the movies and their clients would have been better off um, and it's very rare. It hasn't happened in over a hundred years where a fiat currency leads the way. Um, and 90% of asset classes globally, not just the U.S., if you take bonds globally in emerging countries, in Europe, etc., it's all negative for 2018. If you remember, 2017 was all about indulgence. S&P 500, the NASDAQ, the Dow, cryptocurrencies, every single month on very low volatility, they went up, went up substantially. And in 2018, with the announcements of, of uh, uh, the, the trade, the tariffs, basically at the, at the start of the year, and with the Federal Reserve leading the quantitative tightening, while other um, central banks like the ECB and um, and the BOJ, uh, the Bank of Japan, not doing the same thing. The dollar has enjoyed basically uh, 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 this uh, squeeze in liquidity for it, which has allowed it to become a very uh, strong currency 
compared with other ones. And the tariffs have made bonds and uh, stocks look unattractive in the meantime. So fiat currencies have uh, prevailed in 2018. This is very important because in 2019, you can look for a cyclical top for the U.S. dollar as the ECB, which is the European Central Bank, and the BOJ, which is the Japan Central Bank, look to start uh, tightening themselves. And they will look, the euro in the end will start looking better relatively to the dollar. So you can look at dollar weakness. Dollar weakness means a lot, um, a lot to oil prices, a lot to silver prices. Um, you can already see gold starting to move uh, in the last two days, it's gone from about uh, 1,200 to to 1,240 uh, as we're doing this interview. And I think the the main theme is what nobody's talking about. But, uh, Kerry, I did mention this in an interview two days ago, and I'll let you know that this is uh, something very important. Jerome Powell, um, I know everyone talks about the fact that he said that um, uh, that interest rates are far from being normal and then change his stance just a few days ago to they're very close to normal, which is another way of saying we're going to stop hiking interest rates very soon. But I don't think that everybody has paid attention to another quote that he gave last Wednesday, and that is that he said, I think we finally found a way, that's a direct quote, we finally found a way to keep the economy robust, Mm -hmm. unemployment very low, inflation tamed, and I think we cracked that equation of keeping the economy robust with low unemployment and low inflation, and that is very troubling for a central banker to say that he's cracked and engineered a way to keep inflation low while uh, unemployment is very low. And to say that with such confidence, that gives me the concern that they're not watching inflation in the right way. And then he added to it the, the, very, um, the very essence of globalist agenda. He says, while we're doing this, while we are gonna keep inflation low, and unemployment very low, Kerry. He said we're going to keep wages stagnant. So Powell's actions uh, are very significant, aren't they? But how can they be? How can they be that smug, that arrogant, to believe that they've effectively cracked the code for consistent monetary growth, consistent uh, growth of the money supply, no inflation, e- economic growth, and uh, wages stay stable. Isn't that yeah, arrogant? Not, not only that, but w- what I um, um, really think is important is that he wants wages to be stable. Now, mm-hmm. people want wages to go up. You know, the, yeah. the, the, the average person, he wants uh, better wages. He doesn't want a stagnant wages. He doesn't want to get uh, all of his value outsourced to cheap labor countries. He doesn't want to uh, get replaced by robotics or by automation, he wants to, to be able to make more money every single year because even though they want to keep it at low inflation, they want inflation uh, to be out there. So you need to beat inflation. So what they're basically telling you is we want an economy that has very low savings rates and we want everyone to invest in something. Mm-hmm. We want everyone to be invested. and. I think that is something that uh, is not healthy for an economy like the U.S., where you have about half of the people that can not scrub $400 together for a medical emergency. And that is a recent stat. So mm-hmm. it, it just uh, it goes back to what Warren Buffett says, uh, said in the last Berkshire meeting. And he said, look, with inflation at two and a half percent and the 10 year bond at three percent, the government clearly doesn't want your money. Uh, mm-hmm. They want you to, to, to go into the stock market. They want you to go into real estate. They want you to generate capital gains tax uh, so, so that they can um, pay for all the obligations. And this goes into the next um, important subject that I see in the world, and that is the rise of populism. You can see that in Paris right now, what's going on. Um, mm-hmm. and, and that's just the start of what I think will happen because governments, they always project uh, budgets according to the best uh, case scenario. So for 2019, the U.S. is already projected to have a $1.3 trillion um, deficit. 
and mm -hmm. in their budget, which is just remarkable when you think about it, right? It's just yeah. the interest on that oh, is about madness. a billion and a half a day. So mm -hmm. 1.5 billion a day just goes to interest. Mm -hmm. uh, then you have um, in recessions, obviously, you have more income security to pay more unemployment benefits, less tax receipts from corporations, uh, less capital gains from um, from the stock market. And I just, I just think that the U.S. will find it hard to fund all of this with mm -hmm. foreigners' money as they have. The U.S. is the only country in the world where 40% of everything that the government pays for is funded by other countries. Mm -hmm. So just Im imagine how warped that is, that the US government pays its troops, pays the gasoline for all the tanks, the planes, everything like that, and the funder is Japan or China or uh, the creditors. And same thing with all of the Medicare and Medicaid, the tax receipts are just not enough to pay out everything that the US uh, government is as promised, mm -hmm. and there's going to be a major um, event surrounding this uh, during the election cycle because it looks to me like the U.S. will need to start uh, printing currency outright, uh, which is even more, which is directly inflationary. This is not issuing a bond and selling it to the Federal Reserve. This is mm -hmm. actually printing currency, adding to the money supply just outright, uh, and, and this might happen if. Uh, foreigners will stop coming to the auctions, uh, and they have been. Japan is already uh, back to 2011 levels for treasury debt. Uh, the Russia has liquidated 86% of their treasury debt. China has not bought, um, has not increased their treasury debt in several years. And this is very, very, uh, it's a unique situation. And obviously, it's it's caused um, in part by the fact that uh, Donald Trump is uh, is in a state of renegotiating everything. And mm -hmm. when you renegotiate, people take a step back and they think about uh, what they have done thus far. So I think it's a very interesting time. And I am really looking at silver uh, as one of the most important assets to own in 2019 if it breaks out because uh, it's the most inversely correlated to the US dollar. And for the US dollar to be the top performing asset of, of a calendar year is very rare. Uh, and it obviously will indicate a reversion to the mean at some point. Mm -hmm. So, but you know, what about the fact that the Chinese, as quick as they make their fortunes, they're getting it the hell out of China. They're coming to the US, they're investing in the US. And, you know, you've got this flight capital because there's no rule of law, reliable rule of law in China. You got the social uh, credit scoring now. They keep tightening the noose on the people and the Chinese will always find a way to get their money out of China and out of harm's way. I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, look, the, the United States, and I've said this many times, it's a tale of two economies. Uh, if you go to wealthresearchgroup.com forward slash portfolio, and you'll see what I'm doing personally in my own portfolio, you'll see that the U.S. for me is number one. It's still the number one country in the world, but it's just declining. Uh, the mm -hmm. gap that it used to have uh, over other countries is the declining, but it's still number one. The government is in huge trouble. Washington is in huge trouble. A $21.6 trillion uh, uh, federal deficit, a federal uh, debt mm -hmm. is unbelievable. But for corporate America, if you go down the list of the Fortune 500 companies, the S&P 500, there are just incredible companies out there growing at 10 to 15 to 20 percent a year. I mean, just just imagine Google is a company that grows faster than Warren Buffett's company at its record days. So mm -hmm. just imagine how how unique that company has been. Now, I, I don't uh, invest in Google right now, but since the IPO uh, over 10 years ago until today, that, that has been a machine that cranks out at 20% growth every year. It's just mm -hmm. insane. And there are many companies like that. Um, and I think people, um, need to understand that America has incredible entrepreneurs, a very, very robust um, business um, 
uh, corporate America. And I think that also uh, with what you're saying, that is very important because many U.S. corporations are now getting most of their income from Asia, from the developing world, from emerging markets. Um, so just to give you an example, a company like Starbucks, it opens a branch in China every 15 hours. Hmm. That That's is amazing. remarkable. Really? Um, in the U.S., there are 14,000 Subways and about 4,000 McDonald's and 4,000 uh, Starbucks. Mm-hmm. And their agenda is to uh, to get 4,000 um, branches in China as soon as possible. So, mm-hmm. and there are a long ways from, from doing that. Uh, McDonald's, which is an American icon company, right? 65% of its income comes from Europe and Asia. So yeah. there are many companies that uh, already understand this shift. And that is uh, why a country with about 5% of the world's population cannot sustain a situation where they're a quarter of the world's economy if, um, if they don't find ways to become productive. And in the U.S. right now, productivity is derived from having HQ. So companies have their headquarters in the U.S., and have their brains in the U.S. They're paying the highest salaries to U.S. personnel, but most of the manufacturing and, and a lot of the servicing is outside the U.S. And I think uh, many um, people that are now millennials and are 20 to 30 to 35, they will find themselves in a situation where they will probably um, have to be displaced at some point in their career two or three or four times um, and, and change the way that they work. So I think in the U.S., um, it's it's going to be one of the first countries that goes over the hurdle. They're not going to be called a developed nation anymore. There's going to be a new term for what happens in the U.S. because um, they have grown so rapidly um, and to a point where it's a 70 percent service economy and therefore uh, there are there aren't many manufacturing jobs and you need to find yourself in this 21st century doing something. Right. So the professions that, that are going to um, emerge are going to be professions that might be um, a, a, a merge of government and pro- private partnership. And I'll give you an example. Um, uh, there's already uh, many initiatives by the U.S. government uh, to go into distressed uh, zip codes throughout mm-hmm. America and revive them uh, because that's where the potential is. That's where the opportunity is to revive places where people have uh, uh, very, uh, they don't finish high school and they don't have a lot of jobs, etc. Now, the way you, um, you create the situation is you incentivize private businesses or publicly traded companies to go into these areas. Uh, the first thing you do is get the banks to open branches there and start lending and, and start the business cycle. So right now, JP Morgan is going into many distressed areas in, in the United States and they're open uh, banking branches. And mm-hmm. you're going to see a lot of that private and uh, uh, private companies with the government's help going into areas. It's going to be uh, something that's going to be very uh, big in the next decade. It's going to be called private public partnerships. And Uh you're going to see a lot of that. And that's how the U S is planning to uh, get more people into the, into the uh, business cycle and more people out of minimum wage um, jobs, because that's, that's the real problem. The wealth gap inside of the United States, where you see people living in $20 million homes. And then Mm -hmm. right outside of that, you see someone on the street and that's, that's very bad for, for any economy. Uh, in, in any country and it, it warps elections it, it changes everything and mm-hmm. there's a lot of impression management the rich need to make the impression that they're uh, right. not that rich the poor need to make the impression that they're really poor in order to get more benefits it's yeah. just not a, a legitimate honest country and um it's going to be a major theme obviously in, in the next election absolutely cycle. all right well hey that's it for now leo